Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is October 25th, 2015. Today is Reformation Sunday. Uh, we're located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 937-323-0519. Our pastor is Pastor John H. Pollock. He is on vacation this week, so our guest pastor is Dr. Tim Thornton. Uh, remember to mark the calendars for November 19th, 20th, and 21st, the Yuletide Festival and Auction. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there, and we're happy to have you today with our service. Does anyone have news to share? Items for the community? Uh, stuff that we need to help each other understand as we begin our worship? If not, let's join in confessing and acknowledging our God in the order for confession. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captives of sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be like your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. For without your Holy Spirit and your faithful people, keep us steadfast in your word, protect and comfort them in times of trial, defend them against all enemies of the gospel, and restore the church to your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns in the kingdom of the Holy Spirit, one God. Diane Myers will do the first reading. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. Dimitriou will do the song. Prescribed by the law. 
They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We will have special music by the choir.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen Christ. And if any of you is having any difficulty hearing, I will make actually this excuse. The office is locked. <laughs> I'm not wearing a neck mic. Uh, so if you want me to come a little closer, it gets a little scary at times. <laughs> but you know, the church actually is about that. Is this safe distance, sir? <laughs> Just need to make sure, because we're going to talk about the church. Well, what I want to do is raise a question with you. I'm going to provide an answer. It may not be the answers that some of you were expecting for the question I raised, but I'm going to answer it in the form that you've come to know, those of you who've tracked with me for some years now. I walk through the scriptures by telling some stories about people who have helped me understand the scriptures. They don't know that, but it's true. And the question quite simply is this. Why are you here? Why do we come to church? Why does anybody go to church? Points? Make God happy? Bad habits? How am I doing so far? <laughs> It's Reformation Sunday. It's the one Sunday of the year on which we actually acknowledge our heritage and its distinct contribution to the Christian faith. And it's now just shy of 500 years ago that Martin Luther started the whole mess by basically asking the same question of himself, his supervisor, superiors, and the religious order of which he was a part, his academic colleagues. Why, why are we going to church? Who's getting some pennies out of this? What's, I mean, I'm certainly not getting any satisfaction, it's no fun. Is that a good paraphrase of history? Church is not fun for a lot of people. They do it out of a sense of duty, but now the issue really is, what is it that Martin Luther was really trying to get at? Why are we here? And I'm going to suggest that there is a single word that covers all of the answers which I can imagine. It's probably not the word that would come to you, but it is a word that collects up and gathers both personal and social kinds of things. And the word is community. It is in community that we can find, for instance, the personal satisfaction that we come and get reaffirmed for who we are. We can have our identity <coughs> repeated and identified for what we think it's important because we've told the neighbor in a, who's always sits next to us the same story for 20 or 30 years. It's a place where we can come for solace, for sometimes just reassurance, sometimes a little bit of support, sometimes it is like the person I knew about, actually this goes back almost 20 years, but the, and I may have, by the way, if I've told you stories like this before, just kind of say, you know, I'm, I'm reviewing a few things, okay? Kim over there has heard all these stories before, so you can just be quiet. A couple was having a terrible time with his marriage. The man in particular was all torn up about it, and we were having a Lenten service, and I came early to do the kinds of things that I do up here. Um, and I saw out in the worship area, sitting about where my friend here is sitting, this young husband, father, and he was sitting all by himself, and he was crying. So I came over and sat down beside him, and I said his name, is there anything I can do? He said, no, through his tears, he said, if I can't cry in church, where can I cry? That's a gift we give each other. It's a place we make where some of those personal needs can be actually satisfied, or at least addressed. And hopefully we are doing that. Why do we come to church? Partly it's for ourselves, but partly it's for someone else. 
to be there in the, in the cliche, to be there for someone. That's a community. You need a community to do that. But the other side of it is that there is a social dimension which leads me to say, you know, together what we really have as a community is an opportunity to do things. For each other and for the world and all of the opportunities that God lays before us. The kinds of things we can't do alone, the kinds of things that include preserving and protecting the gospel, paying your pastor and giving him a vacation so that he can go be a grandparent. To get renewed so that he can come back and do his job and minister as you all want him to do in this community. That's something we do together. That's a community function. Coming together to give your offerings or bring your foods or get organized or pick up the phone and, oh, it's that person from Jake Johns wants me to serve again. Never happens. St. John's is so well regarded in this larger secular community for its outreach programs, its health programs, and it's all stuff that we can't do alone. We need each other to do it. Church is the structure that provides it. And we need that. And the world needs it. Why do we come to church? Well, if you want one word, I'll say this. Now, Jeremiah had a vision of God's community as something rather different from anything that we could imagine because he phrases it as this time when God's word will be implanted in every heart. We won't need structures, we won't need preachers, we won't need... Can you imagine what our world would really look like if Jeremiah's vision was there? And in, in any truth, a reality? I would have to say that our world and our church is a work in progress. We're not there yet. So it's a vision, it's a goal, it's an ideal. But if we really also listen to Jeremiah, there are some serious implications of what he's saying because if it's going to shatter barriers, it's going to bring down walls, it's going to force us to recognize some of the things that our world sets up and allows us to do destructively to each other. And for that to happen, we got some work to do, folks. Yes, we like to think that God is going to make all this happen, but you know, how does God work? He uses us through the institutions that we are capable of putting up, and it's called church. So being church is hard work. Don't lose sight of the vision of why we're doing it. To give praise and to give vehicle and to give opportunity for God's word to be heard and made manifest in everything that we do. But it is hard work and one needs to balance, of course, always the vision and the practicalities. My first year of seminary, I was, as all seminarians are, I was assigned to uh, work with a particular parish as the, I don't know what we call it, ministry's assistant or something like that. Before I started, I went and had an interview with the man to whom I was uh, assigned, and I asked him, because I was feeling rather social science -y at the moment, I said, uh, so what are the prospects in this community for church growth? And he looked at me like I was some naive fool from another planet. Maybe I was. And he said, well, you know, there's always room for the gospel. Yeah. But he didn't get it. And he didn't get it in the way in which we really might measure things. His church was not growing. It was not, he was barely holding still. Because he was not really engaging with the realities, the hard work of the world in which his little church congregation is placed. You gotta have both. So why do we come to church? Well, it's in part to have a community that can complement our strengths and overcome our individual weaknesses so that we can share that ideal and go out and work. Well, Martin Luther, 
comes along and says, yeah, but it's still, that's not mine. For what are we ultimately working? Why should I bother? What is in it? Where is the, there's a catch somewhere. He was struggling to find it until he hit on Paul's letter to the church at Rome. And then comes the insight that we usually mention when we say it gives rise to the Reformation. But what was it? Well, for starters, it's that descriptive of hard reality. All have sinned. Me too. anything. God just gives you this gift. 
And this hard-working pastor's wife, church organist, choir leader, school teacher said, but, but, but I have to do something. She couldn't simply be given a gift. And she was the hardest person to give gifts to. Anyway. So that also was part of her. Part of our gift is to be able to tell others, look, you're okay. You don't need to do anything. God loves me. God loves you. That's all that matters. You don't have to do anything. Clean up the room. Drive on the right side of the road. Stay sober. I'm not going to explain And I use the word accepted on purpose for this reason. Earlier this summer, I heard an interview with a Lutheran pastor on the radio. The pastor had recently written a book about her experiences. She is a pastor in Denver, um, and probably the sort of pastor who um, would make most of us uncomfortable. Uh, for one thing, I've seen pictures of her on um, couple of websites. Imagine someone who is as heavily tattooed in reds and greens and blues, uh, so much so that if she's not covered up with all this kind of stuff, you would be so distracted by what you see, you couldn't concentrate on what you say. Okay? Imagine if I were to, at communion time, were to reach out and some skin would show and you'd realize I'm tatted all the way down there. She had her life turned around. She found her own new life in the Lutheran insight that God loves and accepts us. Here. That she could be herself. She wrote about it in the morning. Started a church in which she realized that people needed a place where they could simply come and be accepted. You know, the, the former prostitutes, or maybe the working prostitutes, the, 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 the gays and the lesbians, the, the, the people who are trying to stay sober, where do we find them in church? We expect them to clean up their act before they come, don't we? So they fit in? And the answer is, <laughs> no, those are the kind of people that Jesus called us to serve. They are precisely the people whom God wants us to do what God does, which is love them. Accept. I don't know of a better word for salvation than acceptance. And it is our challenge. God's accepting us. All he, God asks of us is that we attempt to accept others. And you know the political implications of that? All you have to do is look at the current presidential campaign. I'm not making any party issues. It's across the board. All candidates are having a trouble finding ways to accept other people and who are different. If we really live in a world that Jeremiah and Romans saw, I think we would say, oh, well, I have a phrase for it. Jesus said in a conversation that the truth will set free. It wasn't very well understood. People asked for clarification. And so, of course, he goes on with the phrasing about, you know, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. My spin on that is, if God accepts us, then we really are acceptable. That is what the gospel is. In our tradition, we do symbolize it and embody it in our gestures and actions, such as the sacrament of communion. We bless bread and wine, and we say this is the body and blood of Christ. I think the body of Christ in many ways is not just bread, or even bread at all. It is the community that comes together to be body for whatever needs to happen. And therefore, one last story. Early in my pastoring, 
I was, as I still have to do, visiting a nursing home. Not everyone is able to come to the assembly room or the common room for the singing and the praying and the whatever that it happens there. Sometimes people are just tied to their rooms for reasons that are beyond their health. You all know and can see people for whom there is that little extra thing that sometimes is just hard. So we had our little gathering in the commons room and then I'm with the help of a member of the parish came around with this little pattern of bread. And your, moment, your name for the moment is Jim, okay? Okay, because his name is Jim. I went to the guy's room. I said, Jim, this is the body of Christ. And he looked at me and said, how about that? <laughs> and I thought, I have never heard a better amen. All of the surprise, all of the mystery, all of the wonderfulness, all of the opportunity, all of the community, all of the grace that God is for all of us is in that. How about that? When we gather as church and begin to see what God's ideas can do in our lives, it's always a surprise. But you know, the response is never either I told you so, or it couldn't happen, or it's, how about that? Amen. Christ to 
serve our neighbor in our daily commons, that we might bear fruit in keeping with our new lives as God's children to the glory of our Father. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who are burdened in body or mind, let the Lord may mercifully sustain them in their trials and grant them health and healing in accordance to his word. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those whose hearts grieve for departed loved ones, that they may be comforted with the truth that those whom the Son sets free remain in the Father's house forever. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For God's faithful servants of old, who faithfully spoke his truth, remembering especially this day his child and servant, Martin, let us give thanks to God that by his grace we may one day also stand with this great cloud of witnesses. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, dear Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Actually, uh, that, that jumps the gun. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Um, I, I want you to be church before you get your money to the church. I want you to be church. And, and the custom is this. Peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Now, take a minute uh, before you dig in your pockets to share that message.
continuous view rather than split by size, uh, the servers will start here and just kind of keep going. Okay. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts.
thank you for being with us today. You can watch our service on YouTube every week. We have a Wednesday evening service at 6.30 in the chapel every Wednesday with communion. St. John's Ministries are the outreach store, the food pantry, and the rainbow table. If you have any questions about our church or our services, uh, feel free to call the church office at 937-323-7508. We're located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio, the corner of uh, Wittenberg and Columbia, across from Springfield Regional Hospital. Thank you again for listening to our service.